want to thank everybody for coming tonight here. Um, we're looking forward to Lois's presentation. And I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of the Federation. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, the Federation is a vital part of our Jewish community. And despite our current situation, um, we are still able to convene and connect with everybody. And we are thrilled, uh, which is part of our mission. Um, we have new innovative ways to get together and thank thankfully we have the opportunity to stay connected with everybody and bring you fascinating programs like this. We're excited to hear tonight about Lois's firsthand account and experience in the West Bank. And now I'll let her mother tell you a little about her. <laughs> okay. Well, after years of working in the field of education and educational technology, Lois now devotes herself to Jewish communal service. She's a past chair of the UJA Federation, Westchester Women's Philanthropy, and sits on the Women's Executive Committee of UJA Federation of New York. She chairs the Immersive Jewish Experiences Allocation Committee for UJA Federation of New York as well. She's a founding member of the Neshamot Women's Impact Philanthropy Group, Lois serves on the board of directors and the executive committee of the Jewish Education Project and the Foundation of Jewish Camps and serves as vice chair of the international BBYO board. She is also a trustee for the LaFell School, that's the Jewish Day School of Westchester County, and is a certified yoga instructor and is the daughter of Margie and Bob Kahn. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Can I, can I do a little housekeeping real quick before um, you sure. start, Lois? Um, I want to acknowledge Karen Abrams and Beth Solomon um, for hosting, for being hostesses tonight. And um, also, I'm going to be moderating. I'm Linda Schuster, in case you don't know. Um, and I'm going to moderate. So if you have questions, um, at the bottom, you have a chat and you can type in your questions and then I'm happy to um, ask that, um, ask Lois all these questions and um, we're excited to have her. Okay, and Lois was approached by her rabbi to join the Encounters program, Visit to Israel. So Encounters is a diverse group of Jewish leaders um, ready to encounter the complex stories, people and places at the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I'll let her explain some more about the program. Okay. It's all you, Lois. So thank you. First of all, it's so good to be back in Louisville. So thank you for letting me come home for this. And it's so good to see all of these familiar faces. And it's a pleasure to be doing something for Federation in Louisville. I'm sure like New York Federation is really stepping in now. Um, in this difficult time, and I've been amazed by what's happening with our Federation. I'm sure it's no different in Louisville. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this experience. It's kind of nice to talk about something other than this pandemic. So it's, it's nice to think back to the beginning of December, the first week in December, when um, I went on this um, encounter trip, and I'll, I'll get to more about encounter and, and how, I, how I got to this trip. But I just want to put it out there from the start that I am no expert on the conflict in the Middle East. I'm just someone who loves Israel. Um, I, love, I love going to Israel. I love that when I get off that 12 hour flight and you feel kind of crappy and you walk through that hallway and you see Bruchim Habayim, you see Hebrew all around you and you feel like you're coming home um, in a certain way. And I love walking on the Tayelet along the beach in Tel Aviv. And I love when I have my first hummus. And I love walking through the markets. And I love hiking in Israel. And I love that my kids love Israel and love being there. Um, and that right bottom corner, you can see that I got to go on um, with my parents. UJ Federation New York did a hundredth anniversary, the hundredth anniversary of Federation in New York um, two years ago. Was it two years ago? Um, and that was an amazing mission. Any opportunity I possibly get to go to Israel, I, I try to seize it. I told my family I would love to try to get there once a year if I can, and I've been pretty good about it. So 
So um, real quick, uh, Lois, um, make sure that everyone can, so Lois has a PowerPoint that she's showing. Can everyone see the screen? Make sure that you, um, you can put your view on speaker view and um, and just lessen the you you pick the one bar where it says the view up up and in, in, in the corner and um, and then you can see the PowerPoint. Sorry. Great. And there's the, um, also the chat feature. So if you have any questions, you can um, uh, write those in and Linda's monitoring that as well. So um, prior to my trip to Israel, I've um, again been many times, but I really never had any encounters with Palestinians. Um, maybe an occasional taxi driver here and there. And I really knew nothing about Palestinian life. So I have the narrative of Israel that I know, that I learned, and that's, that's my entire perception, as I'm sure for most of you it is as well. So two years ago, I was um, invited on this program called Encounter, which is an, organi it's an educational organization. And what they're trying to do is to advance constructive Jewish leadership on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It was started by um, two rabbis, two female rabbis in 2005, trying to, to help Jewish leaders become more engaged and, and to create meaningful connections between um, Jewish Americans and Palestinians. Now you might, might ask, well, why Jewish Americans? Um, it's really a practical issue because Israelis can't go into the Palestinian territories. So this was a way to start. And I happen to think that as this program has become pretty successful, and I think as it grows, they're going to try to bring more Israelis in because so many Israelis are actually really interested in, in this program. So historically, it was um, a lot of rabbis have been, I would say probably in New York, every rabbi of every major synagogue has been on the encounter program. Um, many of them did not tell their congregations at the time. For a while, it was sort of a hush-hush thing, and now it's become a, a pretty, um, starting to become a pretty well-known yeah, and respected like program. Mm -hmm. A lot of leaders from different communal organizations have also been philanthropists. So I, I had been invited on a trip two years ago um, as a representative of one of the organizations I'm involved in, and the timing didn't really work for me to go. And then and I also thought, I, I want this experience, and, it's, and the, the idea is that you spend time studying before, then you go for five days with a group to the Palestinian territories. You spend five days in the Palestinian territories, um, which is the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Ramallah. And then you have this afterwards, you continue to learn a bit together. But the trip that I would have gone on two years ago would have been people from around the country, and I wouldn't have been able to engage with them, um, you know, on, on the kind of basis as, if, as compared to if I went with people that, who I knew. And my rabbi, David Shuck, had gone on Encounter several years ago, and he, he, was, he found it very compelling the first time he went, so much so that he then became a facilitator and has gone on subsequent encounter trips. So he approached, a, approached Encounter and said that he really wanted to bring a group from our synagogue. And the reason why he wanted to bring a group is because he felt like our synagogue um, always was stymied whenever conversations, any dialogue around Israel. We have um, a very a varied population. There's very uh, those who are very very conservative right wing approach to Israel, and those who have a much more liberal perspective um, belong to J Street. Yeah. And whenever we he would try to have some kind of dialogue about Israel, there was always this clash, and it was really bothering him. And he felt like if he could bring a group on encounter we could start to create a better dialogue within the synagogue. So he organized this trip about a year ago. 20 of us decided to go with him. And again, a, a, a varied group. And we spent a month, actually two months before the trip, just learning together. They split us up into different chavruta learning groups. And they wanted us to, to understand a little bit of history, but also to open our minds to being able to listen. 
the whole purpose of encounter is not necessarily to engage in dialogue, but just to listen to another perspective that you probably don't know. So when we arrived in Israel, we had all spent the night in Jerusalem at this one hotel, the Zion Hotel, that some of you might know. And the trip began in East Jerusalem, which was literally down the street. But the strange thing was, as soon as we went and it was a block away to the other hotel to officially start the trip, it felt like we were in a different country. It was a completely different kind of environment. We were told that we should not speak Hebrew. Um, anyone who wore, wore a kippah was told they should not wear a kippah during the time or a baseball hat, and just try not to draw attention um, to ourselves. Also, once the trip started, Israeli security handed us over to Palestinian security. So we, we were, um, we had, I think, three different people with us, um, Palestinian security with us at all times. Um, I'm also going to tell you about a homestay that we did one night. So I'll, that'll be um, later. I have some slides here just to show you a few pictures from the trip. Um, but one night was a homestay. And during our homestay, um, they gave everyone a uh, like a panic button in case they needed it. I don't think anyone ever felt that they needed it, but just to be safe and they didn't want anyone to feel nervous while, um, while we were engaging in this trip. Okay, so a little bit about um, Encounter's values. Encounter only does not want um, people who are challenging Israel's existence to be part of this. These, the participants from Encounter, um, completely accept Israel's right to exist. They are Zionist. And I wanted to go, especially with a group who I knew felt strongly and as Zionistic as I did. So I'm, just, I'm not gonna read through all these, but hopefully you can see them. Um, they're, not, they're not trying to show, it's only five days. So it can't be completely comprehensive, but the idea is to expose the group to a variety of different people um, who are looking to make change and who and who who want who want to share their perspective. Okay, get to my next slide. One second here. Okay. So I thought what I would do is let me I'll tell you a little bit about um, how how it was organized and then I have a few slides here to show you um, some of the experiences. So we were we were in um, Bethlehem, Hebron, East Jerusalem, and Ramallah. Um, we started the trip. The very first person we met on the trip had was a um, former prisoner who had spent seven years in jail for violence, and his mother happened to be in prison at the same time as he was. So it was clearly learned. However, he got to jail. That was something that he grew up learning and while he was there he he wanted to see his mother she wanted to see him so somehow they were able to communicate that they were going to go on a 17-day hunger strike or they were going to go on a hunger strike until they could see each other while they were both in prison and it ended up being a 17-day hunger strike but they did end up getting to see each other and for him, he said that that experience made him understand that resistance in a nonviolent way actually led to, could lead to change. And he felt, he started to study while he was in prison from that experience, nonviolent resistance or not, and, and also nonviolent um, communication, I guess. When he was released from jail, he actually had been shot at one point in time by an IDF soldier and he had a very complicated leg surgery and at the end of um, I think he had been released and then he was shot and he was back in jail when he was finally re recovering from the surgery his brother was shot by um, an IDF soldier now again we don't know the nature of what was happening but I'm sure there was a reason I'd like to think there was a reason at the time, a Jewish, a group of Jewish, a family who had also lost a 
son in the, in the IDF reached out to his family to express their condolences. And he said he was initially shocked because he thought the Jews had no tears. So this was like, this was my first aha, uh -huh, like my moment of the trip. Like really, he thought Jews had no tears? Like I couldn't even envision that that stereotype existed. So it was the first confrontation of my own stereotypes that I went into this trip with of Palestinians. And I think as the trip moved along, I realized that my stereotypes of Palestinians and the people we met stereotypes of Israelis and Jews were, were very similar to each other. And that was, that was kind of shocking. Um, the, after we, uh, we were also in Bethlehem for a homestay, Hebron and Ramallah. So this first slide here is um, right near Rachel's tomb. So if you ever went to Israel before, uh, you know, years ago, you might have been here. This was the wall that was um, constructed after the Second Intifada. And you'll remember that during the Second Intifada, there were suicide attacks like on a daily basis. So the wall was constructed and as a security measure. It's not a wall everywhere. It's a wall here. In other places, it's more like a fence. And it really, it divided the Palestinian territories from Israel. Now, for, it, it did, the wall did its job because suicide bombings really um, subsided after the wall was erected. However, what it meant for those living in the Palestinian, Palestinian territories was a total restriction um, of movement. So my friend who lives um, outside of Tel Aviv said to me, you know, that wall is what lets me sleep at night. And then I met 25 other people um, who this wall has changed their life and in many cases has changed their livelihood. So the walls in this part here has become a little bit like a um, Berlin wall. And you'll see right here, this walled off hotel. That's the artist Banksy, he started that. Um, it's become an expression. It's, it's a big tourist desti destination now. So from there, we went to a community center. And I think trying to understand the way that the Palestinian territories what life is like. Um, someone who we met here at this, this is where we're standing, this side here is a community center. And this is called the village of Silwan. So if you remember when you're in Jerusalem and you're standing on the Mount of Olives and you're looking down toward the old city, you see in the valley this little village and that's Silwan and it's an Arab enclave. And I think what struck me here about this picture is you see, this is a fence right here, not the wall, but this is a Jewish settlement here. And this is an Arab, Arab enclave here. So in many cases, they're literally on top of each other. And from the Palestinian perspective, you can understand how they feel like they're being squeezed out. The way that the West Bank now um, exists someone one of the people we spoke to said that it was sort of like uh, Swiss cheese so there's enclaves of sort of Arab um, settlements but to get from one to the other you have to go through all kinds of security measures so there's no easy access if your family lives in another village you have to go in and out of security measures in order to see them so getting anywhere just just movement was the, the one thing we heard about time and again it was just so difficult for those trying to make a living and trying to do um, something to, to be able to be constructive for the palestinian community it they were almost cut off even at, at trying and that was that was a frustrating a frustration we've heard over and over um, on the right here is a bookshop um, we met this book owner just go to my slide here. I had his name written down. Um, and he, he's 
and th this bookshop was interesting because there was every possible book on the Arab-Israeli conflict that ever existed. So through his bookshop, he was trying to create a, a cultural domain. There were some really disturbing titles in this bookshop, like the myth of Israel and the Holocaust industry. But there was, there was every, there were books by Israelis and Palestinians and Europeans. Um, he was a, a learned man. And another aha moment happened in this bookshop when um, he was one of the first people to say how he would be happy to have to live in one state, because we hear a lot about a two state solution. All he really wanted was to be able to have full citizenship. Um, another problem is Palestinians can't really travel outside of where they live because they don't have passports. So they don't really belong to any country. So our homestay was outside of Bethlehem. And um, these are two women who I traveled with. Um, and we, the three of us, were staying with Yvonne, who was absolutely lovely. We stayed in her apartment. Her family has lived outside of Bethlehem for over 300 years. So she is very rooted in the land. Um, Yvonne told us the story about how once she used to She's a single woman also, which I think is probably somewhat unique. Um, she used to work in, in um, Jerusalem, but once the wall was erected, it took her so long to get to her job and she kept being late and she finally lost her job. And we heard that again too. People who work in Jerusalem who have to go through the checkpoints, they can only drive their cars up to the checkpoints and then they spend time um, and these checkpoints at, at what is like an airport, going to the airport like twice a day. But, off, but a lot of people told us they would leave their homes at four or five in the morning to be able to get to their job at nine, and they wouldn't get back, back to their homes until eight or nine at night. So she was, Yvonne was, was um, telling us that she had gotten a new job in Bethlehem working for the water authority, but she was worried because she was being forced to retire at the end of December. And she said that she was hoping she could find a job in a gift shop at a hotel. And I keep thinking about her because I can't imagine that there's any, I'm sure all the hotels are shut just like they are here. So she was um, really lovely. We had a, a, a very nice home stay. She made us very comfortable. Um, some of the other people in our group had uh, more eye-opening experiences. Uh, two of the, two women who stayed at, stayed at a home where they did there was no water the whole time. Um, I, I think I have some pictures, but there's water tanks on all the roofs, and every six days they get water. So if there's no water in the tank, they just don't have water for that time, and that depends upon um, that that is controlled by Israeli social services, actually. It's a little bit confusing, but it, the whole West Bank is divided into areas um, A, B, and C. And depending upon if it's Israelis that control the security and the social services or Palestinians, you may or may not have better services. Um, also, elect another uh, a couple that was on the trip, they stayed with a family and the electricity went out for like five hours and the, the family was completely unfazed by it. They said, oh yeah, that happens all the time. So there's not, not a lot of consistency with the utilities. This is a slide, um, a village called Beit Zakaria right here. And right down the hill is, and, and the outskirts here, these are Jewish settlements. This is a Gush Etzion, where the four boys were kidnapped and the Jewish boys were kidnapped and killed in 2000 and what year was that, 13? Um, so from this village, this is the mayor of the village who was speaking to us. And this is the school. So where they are in the zone that they're in, in order to get any permits to do any building, you have to go through the Israeli military. And 98% of the building permits don't ever happen. So they've been trying to replace this corrugated roof on their school, which is for every grade of kids. And they have not been able to get a permit to do any, to just change the roof that apparently leaks or to do any building in the village.
But right here, they, every day they get to see this brand new settlement where um, this is a gymnasium with an indoor pool. And it's just a constant reminder that um, their lives are constricted. Then the next day, this was um, a great hopeful story. So these women here lived in a village um, also on the other side of Bethlehem. And the village had no electricity up until 2017. So these women took it upon themselves. They decided that the men in the village weren't getting enough done that it was ridiculous that they didn't have um, electricity. They were talking about how, how far they had to go to get basic necessities because they didn't have electricity. And they decided they wanted to build a solar field. So here, these are all solar panels. So together, they, 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 these women were able to procure and build this solar field. But as I was saying before, in order to get permits to run it, you were supposed to go through the military, but the Israeli military. But since it's so difficult, often people will just start building because it's not worth waiting and then getting rejected. So that's what they did. And then when the military heard about it, they shut it down for a while. So the women hired an Israeli Jewish woman to represent them, and they actually um, were able. Um, to get it overturned and now their village has electricity. So they were, that just felt so amazing and hopeful that these powerful women took it upon themselves to make real change. And um, I just had to include a picture of this, this boy here because he was adorable. And they fed us this beautiful lunch and he, every time someone finished eating, he came around and made sure they had more food on, on, um, on our plates. So they could not have been more hospitable or more lovely. And they just want to lead lives where their children are safe and where they um, can get their basic needs. So that felt hopeful. And later on in the trip, we found ourselves at a Palestinian refugee camp. So the refugee camps, um, they're a whole complicated situation unto themselves. This is called Aida, and this key here is their symbol um, of the, the keyhole. The key in the keyhole symbol, symbolizes the law of return, that they want to be able to go back to Israel and reclaim their homes. So the re there's no requirement to live in a refugee camp. The people who live in a refugee camp are choosing to live there, and they're making a statement by living there. This particular Camp Aida tends to be the site of a lot of violence, so you might have seen it on the news. Um, this wall right here, they called it the, their Hall of Fame. So all of these people are in jail right now. These are people who live in the camp and um, who are now in jail. So this was, this was a little bit of a tense moment on the trip when someone in our group said, well, why are they in jail? And though the woman who was um, giving us the tour became very defensive and it became a little bit uncomfortable. She also pointed out the picture of this boy right here and she told us that he had been shot by an IDF soldier and she, her story is and, and everyone in the camp story is that he his mother had sent him out and there was an IDF soldier who wanted to see if he was testing his target practice and just shot him for no reason. So that is her story, and that's what she believes. Um, I'd like to think there's a lot more to it. Um, but that was another, this, this, this was one of those complexities that all of us had to, to listen and try to make sense of. But again, we were just there to listen. We also went into their um, community center, and that was a, a little bit of an, an uncomfortable moment, too, only because it just feels like a charged place, and it is a charged place. And then um, our last official stop on our trip was uh, Ramallah. And the Palestinians refer to Ramallah as five-star occupation, because if you didn't know you were in the West Bank, you, you're, you would think you're just in a regular city. Um, there's commerce. There's a lot of wealth in Ramallah. Um, 
the PLO owns a lot in Ramallah. And by the way, speaking of PLO, um, over and over again, we heard that the government was failing. The people who were trying to make change, the government was con a constant source um, of frustration for them. So a little bit on both sides, we heard from Palestinians and then from Israelis that they both in some ways feel like that they're being failed by the government to make any real progress. Um, this, this, uh, this is in the middle of the, like the traffic circle in the middle of the city. And I I'm, try I'm pretty sure that this was after the first intifada that um, when Palestinians would climb up light poles and put Palestinian flags after there was a suicide bombing. Um, and a lot of people got killed doing that, became martyrs. So this was, that's that flag, the symbol of this uh, post here. But we had an interesting um, experience when we were walking around Ramallah, um, a, a group of people from um, walked into this hummus shop and the guy was so excited to see this group and started giving them all kinds of different Fumas and asked where they were from, and he had he had an American accent, so they were, you know, they, they said, where are you from? He's, um, they said, New Rochelle, Scarsdale, Mamaroneck, we're all from Westchester County. And this guy was from Mamaroneck, which is in Westchester County, where we're, we're from. So when it came time to pay, he wouldn't let anyone pay. He said, no, we're neighbors. You're my neighbors. You're here visiting. So that was kind of a, a nice experience there. We also met um, another American Palestinian who lives in Ramallah, um, who is trying to create jobs there, but he also expressed that it's um, a challenge. He, they don't always have um, 3G internet access. And also for him to go from Ramallah to Bethlehem to do business, it should take about 40 minutes, but it usually takes about two and a half hours. So that was another one of those indignities. This is on the last day of our trip and um, the checkpoint, the last checkpoint we had to go through to go back into Jerusalem from East Jerusalem. And um, there are a few things here I'll point out. First of all, you only Israelis can drive through the checkpoints. So you have to have a yellow license plate. The Palestinian license plates are white and green. When you get to the checkpoint, you have to get out of your, they check your car. And then we, this, on our bus, um, a bunch of IDF soldiers came on to the bus, you know, very stern. It felt, you know, even though they were, they were IDF soldiers, they were us, they were other Jewish people. There was something there, it, it felt a little bit scary. I mean, also they took the Palestinian security that we had and they questioned them more off the bus. Um, but a friend of mine reminded me when I was telling him um, that I was going to talk to you today. He said, this, he, "Do you see this gold car right here on the right?" He said, "I he said I remember I experienced cognitive dissonance when I looked at that gold car because I saw like how carefully they were checking and thinking how annoying it must be." And then I thought, but hey, what if it was filled with explosives? Obviously, they have to be that careful when they're checking. So. There were, there were many of those feelings of cognitive dissonance and that was kind of, you know, to be, to be going through into Jerusalem and that was like the one final one. Again, we got a feeling of what it feels like to be there on a daily basis living. So back in Israel, I'm, um, I'm, I got a ride from Jerusalem back to Tel Aviv, um, spent the night along the beach, which I love there, woke up, you know, to this beautiful sunrise and walked along the beach and saw the Israeli flag. And then I was able to meet up with um, a family that we have gotten to know. Um, our Westchester County has a program called the Shinshanim program. And I don't, for those of you who've lived in Louisville for a long time, you might remember the Shlifa program that used to, um, the Shlifa from Israel used to live for a few years, like in Louisville. So the Shinshanim program is for, is a, also a Shlichim program. They're ambassadors and they spend a year between high school and going to the army as ambas teen ambassadors for Israel. So this kid here, Ofek, um, did it for a year and he lived with us for four months. And we all fell in love with Ofek. 
We even brought OFEC to Louisville and he said it was the highlight of his year in, in the States. So I visited with his family and OFEC and his girlfriend, Reut, who I got to meet for the first time, um, started the army, um, well now they're in their second year. Actually, OFEC just last week started officer training. So it was fun to see him. And we, I went out to dinner with his family also the night before. Um, then we went hiking on the Cliffs of Natanya, which was so nice. And they were really interested to hear about the trip. And they were very open-minded about it. And I took this picture here. That this, they just sent this um, last week. This is their family during Yom Ha'atzmaut having a block party um, with their neighbors. You can see they're six feet apart. But his sister here, Nitsan, she had just completed her time in the army, her three years in the IDF. And she had been stationed in Hebron where we had been. And I was explaining to her how surprised I was that the Palestinians we met were so scared of Israelis and of Jews. And she right away said, well, of course, that's all they know. All they know of us are people in uniforms who hold guns. It doesn't surprise me at all. But they were so interested to hear about every aspect of the trip. Whereas other people that I went with went to stay with family and their families were completely just appalled that they had spend time in the Palestinian territories. So interesting how it was perceived. Um, ultimately, just to wrap it up, I think what um, the things that I took away from this were both sides have legitimate claims to the land. We're certainly destined to share the land. Uh, neither of us, Jews or Palestinians, are going anywhere. So it would, it would only be in our best interest to try to figure out ways to um, better understand each other. And I'm really happy that I was able to have this experience. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, so if anybody has questions, I'm happy to ask Lois for you guys. So if you wanna chat, um, just type out a question and I will ask her. And in the meantime, there was somebody that emailed Joni a question. Um, Lois, um, what did other people in the community think of the host? So the woman that you stayed with, um, what did, the, or do you know, what people yeah. thought of the people hosting either Israelis or Jews or whoever? You know, um, that's, it's a, that's an interesting question. The, the people who chose to be, to have, um, to host us, I think most of those um, women were part of a group, their families were part of a group um, promoting nonviolence and peace. Like they were specifically part of an organization doing that. I don't, some of them probably don't share that they're um, housing Zionists. I'm sure many don't. And that's why they told us to be, as we were, spending time there that we should be discreet in general when we were in the West Bank. Great, anybody else have questions? Um, what, were the, what were their thoughts about Americans? Well, they were really happy um, to have us there because they felt like we were, they, they love to have Americans in the West Bank. They want people there bearing witness. So they were very welcoming. They're not- um, so Did you feel safe on the trip? Um, and could you ask questions? Um, yes, we're encouraged to ask questions not to dialogue, but to ask questions and to listen to the answers. It really, we were, we really, I, I can't stress enough how they said, you're not here to dialogue, you're here to listen. Um, and that was hard for a lot of people to do. Um, so as far as feeling safe, there were only the two times where I felt a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I was really never scared for my life. You know, when they said that they were going to give each of us these panic buttons on our homestay, it sounded really scary. And then I met this lovely woman and I was not nervous at all. Um, that time at the refugee camp was a bit uncomfortable because there was just such anger there. 
and everything the refugee camps represent, it's, it's uncomfortable. The only other time was we were staying at this totally dilapidated resort, it, resort in quotes very much, um, outside of Bethlehem. And I had actually requested to have a roommate, but they ended up giving, them, giving me my own room. And the rooms opened to the outside and um, it was a cold night and the heat didn't seem to be working. And I was by myself on the first floor and, and I, I had, had watched too much Fauda, so that was in my head and that was stupid. Um, and also there were these packs of dogs howling throughout the night and I've never heard anything like that. Like, I just, throughout the night, <laughs> dogs and, yeah, so that was the only night I kind of felt uncomfortable, but it was just such a strange scenario. I think that was, I didn't really feel like my life was threatened. Um, did you discuss what children are taught about Israel? So we met with the teacher, um, and I'm sure, again, like we met people who are looking to create a better situation. So um, we, I can go back to a, <laughs> um, can you hear me back to some of the photos? Oh, um, sorry. Oh, there. Okay. No, I don't know. Sorry, that went off. Can you still see? Oh. No, we're, we're, we're looking at your email. So. Oh, okay. There we go. There you go. Um, um, I, I found it interesting when you were talking about the library and, and some of the books were kind of disturbing. Um, did you feel like, so the question was, did you discuss what children are taught about Israel? Okay. Was that something that- so, so we met this teacher and she was a social studies teacher and she and her daughter. Um, and she, she wanted, she told us about how she taught the Holocaust to her students and she's how she teaches about human indignity. So I know that's that is the perspective that I went with that their children are taught, you know, what, what we what we know, these stereotypes. And maybe that does happen. Um, the people we encountered, I, I mean, this teacher, she was I mean, they specifically had a teacher come and speak to us to say, you know, we're this is not what we want for our kids. And basically, her message was, we want the same thing you want for your kids. We want security. We want our kids to be educated. Uh, we want our kids to be able to go to university and to get jobs. They want the same things. And by the way, the, the, that was surprising, too, the level of education. It's, the Palestinian community is, is highly educated and very much values education. What are next steps? What do you think the next steps are? Well, for our synagogue specifically, they're trying to just create a situation where we can talk more openly um, about Israel and this inconvenient pandemic stopped everything in its path. Um, as far as encounter, there's no, there's no way you can go have an experience like this and not feel like everyone could be doing better. The Israeli government could be doing better. The checkpoints could be a little bit better. They don't have to um, be so difficult. That There could be change that could just make life better. And I think the more exposure to the reality, to understanding the situation, maybe that will create change. It's the, the governments, both governments really have been a really hindered progress. So that's that's tough. The the Palestinian government definitely PLO has definitely let down the people. Um so there are kind of two questions. Do you keep in touch with any of the families? And um did you stay in touch with your host or anyone else you met in the territories? So Yvonne, my host, um we're now Facebook friends. So she posts a lot of messages in Arabic, which I can't really understand, but I get to get to see her. And I should I should check in on her and see how she's doing during this pandemic. But, um, uh, when were you there? Oh, we were there the first week of December. So we left. Uh, I flew out of New York on the Saturday night after Thanksgiving. 
So this is kind of a question. So you weren't allowed to challenge what you were being told. You just kind of had to listen. Yeah, we didn't have to necessarily believe everything. And at the end of every day, we had we were in groups and um, we discussed our experience of the day and we tried to unpack a lot of what we heard and um, we grappled with what we heard. We didn't have to believe it. We were there to listen to it. Right. Um, looks like that's all the questions. Anybody else? Well, I think, um, Lois, thank you so much. It was really interesting and we loved looking at all the pictures. It was great. Um, and thank you for spending your time with us in Louisville. We miss you. Oh, I miss come you see us soon. I, want to. I know your mom yeah. wants you to come and your sister oh. wants you to come. Um, anyway, <laughs> pardon me. We're hoping to do a road trip soon. We Bring it on. Never leave our homes. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us um, and encourage you to continue to support the Federation, especially during this critical time. Um, uh, everyone, if you don't know about the United Jewish Louisville Rapid Response Fund, um, please give if you're able. Um, this will help support those in need as well as ensure that our community organizations continue to thrive. Um, and if you have any questions, you can um, contact Stacy Gordon Funk. She would be happy to tell you about it. And once again, thanks everyone. Thank have you. Have a great night. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.